Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be doing a Q&A session, not necessarily about astronomy or equipment, but about the channel itself. Some of you are apparently interested in the things that go on here, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of these. Okay, what was your first Sirius telescope? Well, it was the 1980s and I was in high school and my buddy and I really wanted a telescope to look through, but neither of us had any money. The physics professor that we had said, you know those photocopiers? I don't know if those of you who are out there are old enough to remember this, but a photocopier in the old days was that, literally that. There was a, took a picture of whatever was on the document glass with, through a lens, and then it just sort of made a facsimile and sent it out the other side. Well, it turns out the lens that's in the middle of a photocopier is just about the right aperture and focal length for a decent refractor. So what my friend and I did, we went around to office buildings and we asked, you guys got any dead photocopiers around here? Like, you're never going to use them again. And every once in a while, we'd come up with someone who said, yes, we're, that's been sitting there. We're never going to, we're never going to use that. So brought our tools with us. You had to get the lens out, which is not easy. It's usually buried right in the center of the thing. And then you just sort of build the rest of the infrastructure around that lens. And actually those things work pretty well. I used one for close to a year while I was saving up to buy my first real commercial telescope. Okay, why don't you reveal the identity of the giveaway winners? It's mainly because they want their privacy. We're getting something like 2 million views or so here a year. I get it, you don't want your name out there. The last giveaway I did for that Teleview 25 millimeter Plossel, it went to a science loving young man in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. I was glad to see him get it. So I sent him the eyepiece. It took about two weeks to get to Ethiopia and then it got hung up in their importing post office, whatever you want to call it, system for almost a month. <laughs> they wanted one thing after another. They wanted a statement from him. They wanted a piece of identification from me. I sent them a copy of my driver's license, but before I did it, I had somebody here who's good at Photoshop change the numbers around. So it's not actually my real driver's license that they got. Then they wanted an invoice from me. I have no idea why they wanted that, but he said that if he doesn't have an invoice, the local authorities could tariff him as much as three times the value of what the product was. And so I had to do something. So I sent them the invoice. Then they wanted a statement from him for something else. We started to get the feeling that maybe somebody was looking to get paid. Yeah, no, we're not paying. <laughs> So eventually, either we wore them down, or that was just the process all along, but he was able to get the eyepiece. Again, a very nice young man. We had a nice email exchange after he got it, so I'm very glad that it went to him. Are these videos hard to make? Well, yes and no. In some ways, they're easy to make because what you're seeing on this channel, this is just what I do anyway. I've been just doing this for the past 25 years or so. The only difference is, is I'm stopping to shoot it on camera. Uh, reviews are easier than others. If I get an 80 millimeter F6 ED APO from some Chinese source supplier, I pretty much know within the first few minutes what I'm gonna say about it. And it's pretty much gonna be the same as all of the others. Some of the other reviews are difficult if it's a brand new object that I haven't seen before. That Denkmeyer Binotron Bino Viewer, it took me I don't know, close to six months to get my thoughts down as to what that was and how I might explain it to you. So in a way, yes, it's easy because I'm just filming what I would do anyway. What makes it tough is stopping to film all of this stuff slows the process down. It can take two to three times as long to do a review as it would have otherwise without having to stop and film it. So I have to set up the lighting and the audio and all of this stuff. Uh, so that's what, that's what makes it difficult. By the way, if anybody's looking to get into this, the two rules of thumb that everybody will tell you about these videos. Number one, the most important part of your video is your audio. Audio is number one. People want to rush out and buy the camera, but it's really the microphone and the audio setup that's the most important. People will tolerate bad video for a short period of time. They will not tolerate bad audio. And the worst sin in all of bad audio, low level. I normalize all of my audio to minus 6 dB. That's actually a bit on the hot side. And the second thing is the most important part of your video is 
your lighting. <laughs> so if you get the audio and the lighting right, the rest of it should be able to take care of itself, at least on the technical front. On the creative side, well, that's up to you. Okay, uh, what kind of camera do you use for shooting these videos? Well, in the early days of the videos, I was using a Canon 6D. I shot in 1080p. When the R6 came out that shot in 4K, I switched to that, and I think for about three-fourths of the time I've been doing this, it's been the Canon R6. Now, what do I think about that camera? You know, I might wind up doing a review on it, and it's not going to be necessarily a positive review. I have a lot of frustrations about this model. I think they released it before it was ready, and I don't think they had enough real-world usage on it before they released this product, because those of us who use these things every day, I'm very frustrated by this thing. On the positive side, the R6's video quality is excellent. I know I'm not going to have to color grade any of this footage I'm shooting right now. It looks really, really good. The 6D and the cameras before, those Canon cameras had a reputation for having washed out images. That's not so with the R6. Their images are clear, contrasty, and punchy. I really like the way they look. That's the positive side. There's a host of other things about this thing that just drive me insane. Autofocus. I don't care what any other reviewer has told you. The R6's autofocus in video does not work. It does not. Use it at your peril. I don't know what this is, but this is not a difficult autofocus situation. It will miss. Instead of focusing on my face or my eyes, it'll pick something in the background. Now take a look at this screenshot. You can see what it's doing. It's focusing on the object in the background instead of on me. It does this way too much. If you recall the review I did on the Mead 16-inch Starfinder, that big white thing, that was the last time I tried to use this autofocus in earnest. I set it up outside, I shot the entire video, and like a dummy, I did not check the footage until much later when I was importing it into the computer. Every single segment, every film clip I took was out of focus. And it wasn't out of focus by a little bit. It was a lot. All you saw was a blur on the screen. I was so upset. I had to set everything up again and do the whole video all over again. Well, you could say, don't use the autofocus, use the manual focus. Here's where things get really strange. On the old EF series lens, there was an MF or AF switch for manual focus or autofocus. You put the switch in MF and then you just focus by the ring. On these new RF lenses, at least the lower end ones that I, that I have, you put the switch into focus and then you think that the focus ring would, the control ring would focus. No, it's, it's a big fake out, it has nothing to do with it. You have to go into the camera and change menu items so that you can focus. First of all, I don't understand why I should have to do that. The old system was fine. You just put the switch. The second thing, and here's where things get really strange, I can't find any two sources online that can agree as to which items I need to change to focus manually with the control ring. And this includes some of Canon's own literature, which refers to functions that I don't have in my camera, and my firmware is updated. So the R6's autofocus in video does not work. I can't get the manual focus to work. How do I focus? The only solution I have right now is to use an EF to RF adapter and then use the old EF lenses so I can use them the way I did before. But this is unacceptable, folks, and that's not the only thing wrong with this camera. Had I known then what I know now, I probably would have switched to Sony. Okay, next question. What is that painting behind you, that abstract painting? A couple of you have asked that. Yes, I am a visual artist. I do painting. And in the past, I had done a lot of this sort of hyper-realistic sort of painting and drawing. But I don't know, about 20 years ago, I switched and I started doing abstracts. I like the freedom of expression, the ability to concentrate only on form and color and contrast. And painting in abstracts frees you from some of these narratives that conventional artwork puts on you. You have to be responsible with that freedom because even the layman can sense when you're not being completely honest. So yes, I do do some of those paintings. I haven't done it a lot lately because I just haven't had the time. If you don't do this for a while and then you come back to it, it is really awkward feeling. So I just need to find the time, but I'd like to get back into that. All right, where do you see telescope prices going? I get this question a lot. I don't know. <laughs> prices go up and they, they go down. So it's been 
well known here that prices on telescopes have been going up a lot for the past three years and people have been complaining about that and of course I complain too because that's what we do we complain right but it's how soon do we forget that prior to this last three or four years of inflation prices on telescopes for the past 20 years before that had gone down we would say things to each other like no don't buy that yet just wait till six months or a year from now the price will go down so as, as an example, the bellwether that I use is the Orion X-T8. That's that 8-inch Dobsonian you always see me recommending. In 1999 or 2000, when that first appeared in my Orion catalog, it was $499. Now keep in mind, that's year $2,000. In the year 2020, according to the Consumer Price Index, inflation had gone up between 2000 and 2020 by about 50 to 55%. The price of that X-T8 by inflation alone should have been around $750. Now, inflation isn't the only reason prices go up or down, but it's the thing we can measure easily, so let's go ahead and use that. So it should have been $750 by 2020, but instead, the price had fallen to $349. So instead of going up by 50%, it went down by about 30%. So by that measure, yes, the those telescopes were bargains. Now, today, the price of that X-T8 is around $650. Is that a good buy? I'm not sure entirely, but I'm inclined to say, yes, that's a good price for that product. A couple of other observations on pricing. Stuff that existed before this latest round of inflation, like the X-T8, like the Star Blast, like a lot of other things, went up, stayed high, and have not come down. But stuff that's come in after the inflation came in is coming in low again. That Orion Observer 134 that you saw me recommend, that was $250 complete telescope and shipped for that price. And people were even telling me after I did the review, some of you bought them for as little as $200 off of Amazon. And again, that's a shipped price. That's pretty good in this inflationary environment. That uh, SV48P that you saw me review, it was $199, or some people are telling me they paid $249 or $299. You know, that's a lot of scope for the money, especially for how well made that thing is. So if you're looking for a bargain on a new product, look for something that came onto the market after the inflation started. The second thing about pricing is I'm finding a lot of prices on this used stuff is coming down. And it feels as though some of this has to do with the aging out of our hobby. The traditional things that used to sell well tend not to these days. Young people entering the hobby today tend to want astrophotography gear. As an example, if you have a big daub, those things are really hard to move right now. The market for big daubs has gotten very soft. If that's what you've always wanted, you could seek those things out and get a very good bargain right now. Even the market for larger, high-quality APOs, I'm seeing softening quite a bit. Is that a trend, or is this just a blip on the radar? I don't know. But those are bargains you can look for if you like to buy used equipment. Okay, next question. How do I get in touch with Scope Wizard? So if you follow this channel regularly, there is a local club member we have that we have dubbed Scope Wizard. He seems to have a supernatural ability to fix things that have been given up for dead by a lot of other people. He's fixed my CGE mount, for example, three different times using three different methods. So occasionally I'll get a message in saying, how do I get in touch with this guy? I've got this thing and, you know, I do forward those messages on, but I don't think he's terribly interested in going into business right now. Scope Wizard, he's a quiet guy. He's a humble guy. He's somebody who just likes tinkering with things. I don't think he's especially keen on, you know, dealing with irate customers or customers wanting to return things or invoicing and running a business. If that changes, I'll let you know. But for now, he's going to stay our little club scope wizard. Okay, next question. What happened to the Celestron Power Seeker 127 that you reviewed? If you saw that review earlier, that is one of the most hated telescopes in all of amateur astronomy. Don't buy that thing. I pointed out at the end of the review that whoever loaned it to me made no effort to come get it, and my conclusion was, you're getting this back. And so people have been asking me, where is it? Well, I have to show you. 
It's been close to three years now. He has still not contacted me to pick this up. But you know what? You're still getting this back. Okay, and finally, can you make a lot of money off YouTube? Does YouTube pay well? Well, I suppose if you're a Kardashian or a Taylor Swift type of person, YouTube could potentially pay very well and make a lot of money. I don't. People will tell you this. Don't quit your day job. This does not pay anywhere near a living wage. And in fact, if you average everything out, the amount of time I put into these reviews and videos, I'm making far less than minimum wage. You know, I, it pays for some gas maybe or to pick up and drop off this stuff. It pays for maybe some little things that I have to do to fix up these telescopes. This is nowhere near anything that you want to do for a living. I also deliberately hurt myself financially on this channel. I am not a spokesman for anything. None of these videos are sponsored. People have asked. I have no problem with people who do those things, but I'm just not comfortable doing those things myself. I've had people ask me, well, do you have a Patreon account where I can contribute? Again, I'm not comfortable taking your money. I really don't want to do that. You watching these videos is enough for me. You know, when I started this channel about four years ago right now, I told someone my main goal was to create a body of work that I could be proud of long term. The rest is just gravy. That's been more or less true, but what I hadn't counted on is meeting all of you. There are so many wonderful people that I would not have met had it not been for this channel, and I really hope that that continues. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.